Are you ready, Dr. Buchanan? Awesome. All right. Not sure if you can see me, but hopefully you can hear me. So welcome to tonight's segment of Adams State University's faculty lecture series. I am Jess Scalardi, and in addition to my regular duties at Adams State, I'm the coordinator for the faculty lecture series. I would like to make a quick plug for the next lecture event, which is on March 11th, uh, featuring Dr. Kirkland from Psychology presenting her lecture titled Grit in a Meaningful Life, Research in my TED Talk. So for tonight's event, make sure your mics are muted. However, there will be some time for Q and A's where you can engage with Dr. Buchanan in the chat or directly this evening. This evening's event is presented by Dr. Kent Buchanan, Vice President for Academic Affairs. Kent Buchanan has served as Vice President for Academic Affairs at Adams State University since March of 2020. And he was arriving just as the pandemic outbreak was happening. So that was a nice welcome. Before that, he was Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Oklahoma City University as well as Professor of Biology at OCU. Prior to his appointment at OCU, Buchanan was Assistant and Associate Professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Tulane University Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. He has also been an educator and biomedical researcher at Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center and Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation in Oklahoma City. Dr. Buchanan earned his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in microbiology from the University of Oklahoma in Norman. He then received his PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City in 1992. His research include, included host defense mechanisms against fungal pathogens, virulence mechanisms of fungal pathogens, and effects of space flight on fungal pathogenicity and gene expression. More, more recently, his scholarly interests have focused on higher education administration. So this is an interactive lecture. So if there are any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat and I'll monitor those as we proceed in this evening. I hope you enjoy and hope to see you at this next event. So I'm gonna send us over to the other side of campus with Dr. Buchanan now. Thank you, Jess. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, Jess? All right, so tonight's talk, I really wanted to try to focus on the basics of what COVID-19 is, the, the virus that causes the disease, how it starts, and how we can stop it. So that's kind of the, the emphasis here of the biology and the immunology. And so we, in the bottom left here, you can see the uh, coronavirus itself with its spike proteins. And this is my caricature of an antibody molecule, which is the, the main important molecule in host defense. Uh, it, at least when we de design vaccines to try to stop this disease. The nature of this talk tonight kind of, I, I'm forced to, to really do some disclaimers. So this next slide, uh, just bear with me as we uh, go through some disclaimers so I don't get the university in trouble. Got to make this work. All right. First off, I'm, I, my training is in immunology and microbiology, so I am not a physician or a medical practitioner of any sort. I have taught to lots of students in those areas, but I am not qualified nor licensed to give medical advice. Please consult with your personal physician about what is best for you and your health. The opinions presented tonight are mine, and not those of Adams State University. And I welcome any input from the Adams State University faculty and community health professionals that might be on here. I apologize for any liberties I take in, the, in this discussion that those professionals may find unsatisfactory. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat at any point, and Jess will jump in and uh, let me know, and uh, we can, if I need to clarify something or, uh, or if you have a, a, a question that you might want me to, to uh, address. All right, so 
the approach that I decided to take on this was to really kind of go back and talk about how do cells work in the human host. So we get a kind of a background on how our host cells work. Then we kind of shift to well, how viruses work and how this particular virus works. And then kind of get into the actual disease caused by COVID-19 and end up in what we can do to stop it. So this slide has, is kind of a, a, something that I talk to my students about a lot and that's the central dogma of molecular biology. And it's a lot of big words that just means uh, all life forms use the same kind of mechanisms. And that is we have DNA that's in a nucleus or in certain uh, organisms like bacteria, not in a nucleus. You know these as chromosomes. So the DNA is a nucleic acid that's found uh, compartmentalized somewhere inside the cell and it's double-stranded. The DNA is, uh, is a very pristine molecule. We need to keep it intact. We don't want it to be damaged or the host, uh, that cell will have difficulty uh, staying, uh, being able to do some of the things and make some of the proteins, et cetera, the things that they need to stay alive. So we wanna protect the DNA. The DNA molecule can go through the replication process. And I'm just gonna put a little arrow here to show the DNA can be replicated. And that's a very high fidelity uh, process that takes place. And that is, it's very uh, stringent in not having any errors. We have very few errors when it really comes down to it in the replication of DNA when cells proliferate. So we wanna protect that DNA, but we need to use that as the instructions to make the proteins that the cell needs. So we go through a process here called transcription. DNA is a nucleic acid, it's a, it's a double-stranded uh, molecule. And we transcribe that, transcribe simply means we're, we're making a copy of it in a similar type of language uh, to what are called RNA molecules. And I, I, I bring this up because I know if you've been listening to any of the news about the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines, you keep hearing this thing called mRNA. Well, that's what this is. This is messenger RNA. It's a single-stranded RNA copy of the DNA that's in our nucleus. And that uh, has the, the codons that are necessary to encode uh, the proteins that we need. The next process is called translation. And it's called translation because we are actually going to translate from the nucleic acid language into a new language of amino acids that are called proteins. This process is pretty much the same for all life forms that we know about. That does not include viruses. Viruses, in my opinion, are not life forms because for one thing, not all of them have DNA. Some of them start with RNA, like COVID, the, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And viruses are not capable of going through this process on their own. Viruses, as we'll, as we'll see as we go through this, have to get inside our host cells and hijack our machinery to make more of themselves, make their own proteins and make more of themselves to, to have more viruses get out. So the diagram on the right side just kind of illustrates that in a, in a picture. And you can see we have a nucleus up here that is... Uh, that has the, the DNA chromosomes in there, double-stranded DNA. And in the case of humans, we have 46 chromosomes in there, 23 sets of, uh, and with, that are paired. So the DNA, again, is going to be uh, maintained in a protected environment inside the nucleus. It's going to go through replication in there in a very high-fidelity manner so that we always maintain a, a good copy of the important uh, blueprints for our proteins. It goes through a process of transcription where we make some mRNA that then moves out into the cytoplasm of the cell out here where it then uh, interacts with things called ribosomes that will translate the uh, message, messenger RNA into proteins that are composed of amino acids. So this process goes on in all the cells that are, that are of interest to us, even in bacteria, the fungi, the, the parasites, plants, all those different kinds of organisms have this same kind of process going on. Viruses do not. And uh, viruses, as I said, have to get inside the cell and use that machinery that's inside the cell. And so I, I put that down here in the bottom. I've got these little caricatures down here of, 
uh, the uh, receptor on the surface of cells called ACE2. That just happens to be a molecule that is on the surface of many of our host cells, including the epithelial cells you find in the lungs. Corona, this coronavirus is uh, acquired through inhalation. So it has to interact with the cells in the lungs first before it does anything else. And so this ACE2 happens to be the molecule that it binds to. It, the virus has evolved over time to recognize this particular receptor and uses this particular receptor to get into the cell. Other viruses have other means of getting into cells. They bind to, they have molecules that allow them to get into these other places. Now, if we were to look at this a virus at a bigger a scale, which we hear in just a minute, we have these spike proteins all around the outside. Those spike proteins are critical for binding to this receptor and then facilitating the uptake, uh, uptake into the cell. All right, I'm gonna go back to my, to my teaching days and uh, use a, a, the analogy of a factory for how a cell works. And so some of this is, is gonna be uh, repetitious, but just keep in mind, uh, the cell is trying to do the same thing, make the proteins that it needs that are used to make the carbohydrates, the lipids, and the nucleic acids that we need. So here's a factory. The main office is up here. In the main office you have, that's, that's analogous to the nucleus of the cell. That's where the blueprints are for the cog that we're gonna make in our Cogswell Cogs factory, all right? The, we, we don't want those blueprints, those in, instructions that are so critical to leave the nucleus where they could be damaged. So we leave them up there in the files or, or how, if they're electronic files, however you wanna think about it as a, in the analogy to a factory, our main original blueprints blue are up in this nucleus uh, that is called the main office. We have a means of copying those instructions and sending them out of the nucleus into the part of the, of the cell where they can be uh, used. And that would be like the middle manager. So we have, a copy of the instructions, a transcribed copy of the instructions that go out into the cytoplasm. Those copies, those instructions then go to the assembly line. In this case, it would be what, uh, uh, some molecules that we call ribosomes. Ribosomes are where the proteins are made. And so on the assembly line, the proteins get made, and then they'll go to the process of packing, packaging, and shipping. And this is showing the arrow is going outside of the cell. Some molecules are gonna stay inside the cell. Some of these proteins are gonna be useful inside the cell and some are useful outside. They go to another cell. Maybe they go over to the cell that is spacely sprockets or whatever if, uh, where that's being made. Bottom line here is uh, you have a cell structure designed such that we have these blueprints. There's a copy made. The, the, the copy is then translated into a product and the product is used by the cell. I've got some doors down here we could have windows or whatever we want on there. But the, the bottom line that I want to get out of the door is that there are means of going in and out of the cell, but the cell likes to protect those as well. So we've got a lock on the door and we've got a security system that uh, as we'll see, uh, it, uh, the, the cell tries to recognize any intruders and has some natural mechanisms for uh, recognizing those intruders and stopping them. So this is our cell. Let's move on and talk about the virus just a little bit. SARS-CoV-2 is the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. It is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus of about 30,000 nucleotides. That's actually pretty big for a virus, whereas humans is gonna, human genome is gonna be huge, hundreds of millions of base pairs. This is only about 30,000 nucleotides, which is actually pretty big for a virus because they don't encode much. Just some of these structural proteins like the spike proteins and some other things that they need to hijack your, uh, the machinery inside your cell. The, the key thing to get out of this is this positive sense. If you think about uh, copying the DNA into RNA, there's actually two strands of DNA. So you could have two different strands of RNA made. One of them is actually good for translating into proteins. One is just a copy. It's the complementary version and it's not useful for making proteins. 
the positive sense single-stranded RNA virus has the, the molecule, the nucleic acid molecule inside the capsid of the virus that's ready to go be translated into a protein. This particular virus, ha it has an envelope that simply means that when it's coming out of the host cell, it buds out of the host cell and takes part of your host cell membrane with it. And so it has an envelope on it. Why do we care about that? That envelope is susceptible to hot soapy water. That's why we wash our hands all the time. And some of the disinfectants we use are, is good against that envelope. Some viruses don't have that envelope and they're, they're easier to, uh, they, they, they survive in cold temperatures, hot temperatures, a little bit better than these envelope viruses do. The spike proteins, as we mentioned, they're right here, all over this, this virus. The spike protein is critical for the virus to bind to the receptor that it binds to, which is ACE2. And so that's a, a, an important structural protein of this virus. And uh, it, it, the, the way the coronavirus has got their name is because most of them have these, or all of them would really have these prominent spike proteins. And when we look at electron micrographs, which is right here, this is a very powerful microscope, and it's kind of a cross section through the virus, we see these little spike proteins all around there, and it makes it look like a crown or a corona. So that's where they get their names. The genome is inside this viral capsid here and is again as a single stranded RNA. So that kind of is the biology of this virus. It has a few, um, the, the RNA encodes for a few proteins, but not too many. Uh, the, the main one that we're con concerned about is the spike protein. With that in mind, let's talk about how this virus disrupts the cell, gets inside the cell and disrupts it, going back to our factory model that I had. What happens here, we start down here at the bottom, right down here, we have the virus and it has the ability to bind to, it has the, the key to the lock to the door that's, that's uh, kind of holding things out and holding things in of, the, of our factory. So that spike protein is the key. It binds to uh, the receptor. In this case, the key goes into the lock of the door and allows the, the virus to get inside the cell. Now, I'll tell you in just a little bit, uh, the cell knows it. The cell has a way of knowing that something has come inside of the, of the factory or inside the cell. But what will happen is the virus can then come up here and what it'll do is it'll hijack the cell. So instead of having our DNA moving up here and coming over to the middle manager with this copy of instructions, all of that gets shut down, at least most of it does. That stops being done because the virus has taken over the machinery and is using it to, to, to grow some more of its own. So we stop, stop making uh, regular host cell proteins and we start making some of the viral proteins going this way and some of the viral RNA going this way. And in the end, we package the RNA inside the protein capsid or the protein encoded uh, uh, virus. So bottom line here is we've, we've kind of disrupted the normal behavior of the cell. In this case, we're no longer making the COGS. The COGS are necessary for the environment or the community around these cells. And therefore that can disrupt the uh, what's going on around there. But what's more important going on is down here, this part down here, the security systems in this, inside the cell go off. They recognize that there is this single-stranded RNA virus by recognizing some of the products that are made uh, in this area right through here. Dr. Buchanan? Yes. We have a question on, is this like a parasite? And then uh, another question on, where does the 19 come from on COVID-19? The, the 19 is really easy. It started in 2019 was when it was first noticed, was first recognized. Uh, that, that's as simple as it is. It, that's when it came about. Um, as far as a parasite, uh, a parasite is, is, a, is, is kind of a general term. Although we do have some uh, organisms that are called protozoan parasites and helminth parasites. And a parasite is kind of a general term to say, all right, it infects a cell and uh, 
it survives inside the cell and causes some damage to the host. So uh, we don't typically call viruses parasites. We reserve that for other types of pathogenic organisms. So just so we're out there, bacteria, fungi, uh, the, the, very, uh, the protozoan parasites, the helminth parasites, which are very large uh, organisms, are all part of the pathogenic microorganisms. And then the viruses are these very, very small critters that, uh, like I said, they're really not alive. They just get inside our, our cells and take over our machinery. And they have evolved in such a way that they will make lots of, um, lots of themselves. Which brings me to a point. I, I have said several times, and I'm gonna do some, a little bit of erasing here. I've said several times that this part up here, we want to maintain the, the fidelity of our, uh, our DNA. Well, in this case, the COVID-19 virus doesn't even have a DNA molecule. When it goes through the process of growing inside our cells, it takes a positive strand RNA and uses that to make proteins. It uses that positive strand RNA to make negative strand RNA, which serves as a template to make more positive strand RNA. And so the high fidelity piece that we talk about with DNA replication never takes place. So mutations can happen. And so in viruses, anytime you have a lot of proliferation going, a lot of replication of nucleic acids, you can have these mutations taking place a little bit at a time. The, the mutations that are good for the virus are more or less selected for. The, the, the better mutations are, the more you're going to see them uh, survive. And that's what's going on with the takeover of the variant, the COVID-19 variant that has shown up in Britain at first. We had the first case here in Colorado uh, in the United States, and it is quickly taking over all of the cases. It is doubling every nine days in the United States in how many of these, uh, these uh, variants we have. And I'll talk about some of those variants a little bit later. So if there's any other questions, just let me know, we'll move on. This is, now we kind of, we've talked about the biology of, of what the cell normally does and what the, uh, the virus does. And I, I mentioned that when the virus gets inside the cell, uh, it, the, the cell has ways of recognizing that it's been infected. And the, the, we call these natural uh, mechanisms inside the cell. And so you, you may have heard some of the molecules called interferons. So uh, these type one interferons get made by the cell that is infected with a virus. And we're not even talking about some of the other types of uh, adaptive immune mechanisms that take place. Right now, we're just talking about every cell has the ability to do this if it's infected with a virus. What can happen is these interferons in the, uh, get, get produced. And these interferons are part of a group of proteins, immune effector uh, molecules, that we call cytokines. Cyto is cell and kind just is just one of these silly words that immunologists like to use. So cytokines are these molecules that are made during inflammatory responses and, and during uh, immune responses that can modulate what's going on in the host cell. In this case, the infection by the virus in the, in the host cell causes these cytokines to be released inside the, the lung epithelial cells and released outside of the lung epithelial cells and inflammatory cells are recruited in there. These inflammatory cells in, include things like neutrophils, which are uh, very damaging if, they, uh, get, if they're not regulated. They can really uh, damage the tissue quite a bit. So we get inflammation that causes more inflammation and that leads to some of the symptoms that you, you think of when you first start hearing about this person has uh, the symptoms of COVID. It would start with cough, you would get some accumulation of fluid in the lungs, and you would do some, some other things that are associated with edema. And eventually, uh, all of this kind of leads to low oxygenation, which is called hypoxemia. The, the, the low oxygen is when we have to get, uh, patients are then put on ventilators or they're putting on oxygen first, those types of things, because they're not able to get enough oxygen into the blood to go around to the rest of the body. You Dr. end up with, Cannon? yes. Another question, um, mm -hmm. are the cytokine cells part of the immune system? Cytokines are an immune mediator. So cytokines are soluble 
and sometimes membrane-bound membrane proteins. They are part of the immune system, and uh, there's a lot of them. They're called interleukins, and they're called interferons, and things like that, and tumor necrosis factor. And I, I tell you that because uh, there's a lot of things out there these days. Uh, immunotherapy for cancer uses some of these cytokines, and uh, sometimes these things cause damage. Just as an example, rheumatoid arthritis, there's, there's, uh, you, you see commercials all the time, like Humira uh, is a, uh, a therapy for a rheumatoid arthritis. What that is, is it's a therapy to sop up some of these inflammatory cytokines that are causing damage to your joints. And uh, one of the things that they always say in those commercials are, uh, please tell your physician if you've been to a, an area endemic for fungal infections. When you have those kinds of treatments that, uh, that kind of suppress your immune system, it makes you much more uh, susceptible to infectious disease. So uh, briefly, cytokines are part of the immune system and they, uh, they do a lion's share of the work in the immune system. We also have some of these cytokines go to the liver they cause the release of acute phase proteins or acute phase reactants, which causes even more inflammation. And ultimately you end up with respiratory distress, even shock and multi-organ dysfunction, uh, which was really the exacerbated version of COVID-19. And that is the cytokine storm, this term that you might've heard when they talk about COVID-19. It's really not the virus doing it, it's the virus products are causing the immune system to produce these cytokines and these cytokines are causing lots of inflammation. It's the same thing that happens in septic shock when certain bacteria uh, get into your blood system and are, are not controlled. The cytokine levels go way up and cause massive inflammation. So that's the, the phenomenon. That's really what's going on with the virus. Can we, can we stop this? Is infection preventable? The answer is yes, absolutely. How do you stop an infection with this virus, it's a respiratory virus, you just don't inhale the virus. Well, how do you do that? You wear masks. You keep away from people that are infected, social distancing. This is why we've been doing these things. If you don't come in contact with the virus, you can't get infected. So very easy to prevent that if you follow certain processes. If you are infected, if you do come in contact with it, there are lots of natural immune uh, mechanisms that can provide some limited immunity until an acquired immune response comes along. There's also some therapies out there. Just for your information, you guys have all heard about antibiotics. You get a bacterial infection. These antibacterial drugs are prevalent. They're everywhere. Uh, it started with penicillin, penicillin from penicillium, which is a, a mold. And so it was a, an antibacterial agent that's produced by this mold, and we were able to collected Sir Alexander Fleming was the one that, that fi figured this out. And, and now we've got hundreds and hundreds of these antibacterials. They're, they're easy to find and make because bacteria are so different from us that we can, we can cause a toxic product to be put on the bacteria that's not toxic to us. The problem with viruses and antiviral drugs is the viruses are inside our cells using our machinery. So it's difficult to come up with a drug that is specific to stop the virus without being toxic to the, our own host cells. But there are ways around that. And so you've heard about with, with uh, human immunodeficiency virus and AIDS, they came up with a cocktail of things and some of the, the drugs that they came up with were analogs to prevent the replication of the, the virus. Same thing with remdesivir. Remdesivir was originally designed to help with Ebola. What it is, is it's, uh, it's an analog to the, the nucleotides that make up RNA that, is, that disrupts the ability of the transcription to take place. So you shut down the ability of the virus to make more of its RNA or to make RNA to make the proteins that they need. And so there, there's some uh, efficacy with remdesivir. You've also heard about the monoclonal antibodies. And the top one, uh, Bamlanivimab and Atesivimab are from Eli Lilly. These are monoclonal antibodies against the spike protein. And that's what I'm getting ready to, to show you here in a minute is kind of the immunization strategy that's being used right now. Uh, and then the one that you've heard about that, 
President Trump took was a, from Regeneron, was a uh, experimental uh, therapy. That has two monoclonal antibodies in it that recognize the spike protein as, uh, as well. And there's a lot of cool genetic uh, modifications that are, do, that are taking place to, to figure out, okay, if we inject this into a mouse, we can get a, an antibody that works and we can do the uh, uh, genetic engineering to come up with human antibodies with, that recognize these spike proteins. So th there is that approach, but it's, it's difficult to do that and can be time consuming. So another the question. Of, yep. Another question. Um, so uh, the, the statement reads before the question, but not everyone ends up in the hospital with the uh, cryokins. Why is that? Because they're lucky. Uh, they have, uh, they either were not, uh, they did not come in contact with lots of the virus, or they have adequate defense mechanisms in place. Uh, just talk about the, the lungs are uh, contiguous with our mouth and our nose. So that goes down these epithelial cells that make up these linings. They're surfactant proteins and uh, other mucus type things. We have the ciliary ladder that, uh, that will, uh, you know, you cough or, uh, and some of this phlegm comes up. You've got these mechanisms down in your lungs that are grabbing hold of this. It's just, it's just sticky stuff that's grabbing hold of things that we, that we breathe in that shouldn't be in there. We're breathing in the air, but sometimes we breathe in pollen, we bring it, breathe in dirt, we bring in, breathe in viruses. And uh, some people are just taking care of that and getting rid of the virus, or their natural uh, effector mechanisms inside their cells are taking care of it. There's, there could be a hundred different reasons why some people come down with this and some people don't. And uh, scientists just really don't know uh, exactly why, what's going on. And uh, they're actively trying to figure that all out. Good enough? All right, so this is what we're all trying to get right now is a vaccination. So uh, a very good way of stopping this infection is by immunization. And the questions that most people would have is, what is being injected into me to induce an immune response? and what is being produced by the immune system. And uh, what we're gonna see is that the injection material, the stuff being injected uh, varies depending on what the company decided to, to make. But in the end, the goal is to induce the production of what are called neutralizing antibodies. And these antibodies are, are called neutralizing because they really do bind to the virus and neutralize it so it can't bind to the, to the, uh, the host receptors. Similar type of approach to we've all been injected with, uh, we've all been immunized against tetanus. You get the tetanus uh, shots when you're very young and then you're supposed to get it every 10 years. That is, that vaccination or immunization is to induce neutralizing antibodies against the tetanus toxin because if you don't sop that up with antibodies, it will kill you before you are able to make antibodies. So uh, that's, uh, neutralizing antibodies are very important for preventing viruses from entering cells and uh, other types of things like uh, uh, binding up toxic metabolites. This is what's going on. The immunization strategy is basically, let's, let's produce antibodies that will bind to that spike protein. And I, I've got a little picture down here. This is, this is an antibody molecule right down here. It's a Y-shaped molecule that can bind the antigen in two places. It has two arms, each one can bind to the antigen that it's specific for. Antigen is just a term for the, the piece of a, a molecule, protein, lipid, carbohydrate, whatever, that the antibody binds to. So uh, this antibody molecule, we wanna make those inside every body, every host, so that they can bind to that spike protein and now it can no longer bind to the ACE2 receptor and get inside the cell. The, the key thing here, and the reason why clinical trials take so long is because you're immunizing against the spike protein to try to get antibodies against it. You certainly don't want the antibody to interfere with the operation of these receptors. You just want it to neutralize the virus because that receptor on the surface of the host cell may play a critical part. In this case, uh, angiotensin 
converting enzyme, ACE is involved in cardiovascular biology and is important. So we don't want to interfere with that. We want normal functionality. Uh, we don't want the immunization to induce other undesirable immune responses, which can happen. Uh, there's, there was a lot of, uh, well, I want to not even go into it because it, it, it will open up a can of worms. But this is why we do clinical trials. We, the first thing they want to do is, is it, uh, is it if effective? Is there efficacy? Does it prevent the disease from happening? And second, does it cause any additional significant clinical side effects that we need to be concerned about? So that's the strategy. Now let's talk about uh, why it takes so long to get there. This is, this is my part. This is my, uh, I'm an immunologist and this is the stuff that we love. In fact, I was just talking about this today to my students about how antibodies are made. Antibodies are made by cells called B lymphocytes. They're very small cells, the, the, the smallest of the white blood cells that are in your blood. Uh, so these white blood cells, they're produced in the bone marrow. They reside in the lymphoid tissues. The lymphoid tissues would be lymph nodes, spleen, adenoids, tonsils, all kinds of different uh, tissues like that. Each B cell, every, every one of us has the ability to make, a, uh, make antibodies uh, in these B cells to somewhere around five times 10 to the 13 different B cell specificities, specificities. I'm not a mathematician. I think that's about 50 trillion. Everybody listening tonight, however many's left, will uh, have the ability to make B cells with all of these different antigen specificities. The antibodies that they make have these different specificities, but you don't have 50 trillion B cells in your body. You're limited in how many B cells can be there. So, and it's estimated that you probably have about 10 billion different B cells in your body. So you could have B cell specific for 10 billion different antigens. You gotta find the one that recognizes the antigen that you're immunizing with. Somehow you have to find that one in 10 billion B cell and inter uh, have it interact with the antigen. That's where the lymphoid tissues come in. The lymph nodes and the spleen uh, are designed beautifully to maximize this interaction between antigen and the B lymphocytes. And so what happens is the B cell specific for a particular antigen comes in contact with it, it becomes activated, it proliferates, and uh, it makes these antibody molecules. There's some other things that happen as well. Uh, one thing is you, uh, you develop memory B cells. So the next time you come in contact with it, you'll, you'll respond much more quickly. So the, the, the time, they talk about, okay, you get injected and it's gonna be two to three weeks before you see detectable antibodies. It takes a little while for the antigen to come in contact with the B cell, the B cell to become activated, for it to proliferate in such a way to differentiate so that it starts making antibody molecules. It takes a while to get there. Well, then why don't we have the second shot? Why don't we have these booster shots? Well, the, the more times you're introduced to the antigen, the better the antibodies you make are. You make higher affinity, tighter binding antibodies, and they're quicker, they're faster, and they also have different functionalities. The first ones, first antibodies you make against an antigen have a low affinity and they have low, uh, uh, the functionality of the antibody molecules are not very good. The more you, you see this antigen, the better they get and the, the better function you have, the more neutralizing activity you would have against that antigen. So boosting, is helpful in getting better antibodies. The same thing goes if, if with people that have been exposed to COVID-19. They, they've been infected, they've developed antibodies most likely, and maybe they didn't, but if they've, they've gone through the infection, they should have some antibodies. They should go ahead and still get the vaccination, the immunization, because it will boost them and allow them to have a better immune response if they come in contact with it again, which, Probably we will as we go forward because uh, there's gonna be more and more variants coming about. These are what we have. These are the vaccine, vaccines against viruses uh, just kind of give you a sense of what we have from the past and from the present. Uh, the, the original way that we would give vaccinations against viruses was with a whole virus that's attenuated in some way. This was all started by Jenner. And it was back in 1796 when this uh, scientist uh, observed that milkmaids uh, would come down with cowpox, but they wouldn't come down with smallpox. 
and started thinking, well, maybe there's uh, this, whatever's causing the cowpox, because they didn't know what viruses were back then. Maybe whatever's causing the cowpox is related enough to the smallpox that we can give the cowpox to people and uh, make them immune to the, uh, the smallpox. And in fact, that's what they found. In fact, um, the virus that was used to do this eventually was known as vaccinia. That's where vaccination comes from. And vaccine is uh, a derivative of the Latin for cow. So the cowpox and, uh, and uh, this, uh, this scientist Jenner were the ones that uh, identified this a long time ago. Some Dr. other- Cannon? Yes. <clears throat> uh, but the more we have people immunized, the less the virus can mutate, right? It can still mutate if it's in somebody. But you're absolutely right. The, the, less, uh, the more people that are immune against it, then they shut it down. They, they will stop the infection. You won't get more uh, viruses being made. You won't get more mutations of the virus. And so that's what we did with smallpox. Smallpox has been eradicated from the world. Uh, it took a long time to get there, but uh, we did eventually uh, clear all of the infections. There have been a few cases that have come up, and, uh, but you're absolutely right. If, if you immunize folks against this, the more immunity we have, and that's the herd immunity that we talk about, the more uh, immune people we have, the less the virus is gonna be able to keep going. The problem is, is some of these viruses come from animals. This particular virus came from bats. Uh, the, the cousin to it, the MERS uh, virus and the other SARS virus came from something else. There was the, the MERS was is a Middle Eastern derivative, a respiratory virus. It came from camels. So there's an animal reservoir for some of these things. And sometimes they hop over species from animals to humans. And it, sometimes they're gonna be more, uh, more damaging to humans than they are to the, the animal host that they came from. So, so uh, a follow up to that yeah. as well. Um, how does herd immunity work to protect people who can't be immunized? They, they keep the virus from being prevalent is, is simply all it is. The, the herd immunity gets you to a point where there's not much of the virus going around. So the likelihood of somebody that can't get the, the vaccine or has uh, some kind of immunodeficiency, they're not as likely to come in contact with the, with the virus because it's just not there as much as it used to be. All right, so hepatitis A, polio, rabies, these are all examples. There are actually two, two versions of this in process where they're using a whole coronavirus that can't infect the cell, and that's in two places. Uh, Sinopharm and Sinovac are, are making those. There's also a non-replicating viral vector, uh, uh, and there's an Ebola vaccine that uses this approach that you just don't see out there much. Um, uh, what happens here is they take the, the uh, RNA that encodes the spike protein of coronavirus and they put it in another virus that's not gonna cause problems with you. And then that uh, goes through the regular viral replication process and you end up with uh, hopefully antibodies against the spike protein from coronavirus. That's the Oxford AstraZeneca. That's how it works. There are also subcomponent vaccines where a portion of the virus uh, is injected. It's uh, usually we're talking about a protein. So they would take, they would grow up a whole bunch of this spike protein and they would inject a little bit of that into you and try to get antibodies made against that. That's hepatitis B and shingles are examples of those types. And Novavax is the version that's coming out. And then finally, this is, this is the future. This bottom part is what we're hearing right now from Moderna and Pfizer. This has been impossible to do. I have told you that DNA is a very stable molecule. RNA, mRNA is not a very stable molecule. And so to immunize with mRNA that encodes the spike protein is very difficult. Technologically, the, the people who came up with this process have been working on it for like 30 years to try to figure out how to make this work. And this is the first examples of uh, using an mRNA vaccine. The nice thing about this, there's no virus, no possibility of infection by the virus. All you're getting is the genetic material that encodes this spike protein. So it, it's, it's translated into the protein presented to the immune system, you make antibodies, and that's what Moderna and Pfizer do. So um, 
I think that's about uh, all I was going to talk about and open it up to questions, rebuttals, thoughts, stock tips. I'll take whatever you got and be happy to uh, deflect anything that I don't have the expertise to, to answer.